Welcome to our webinar today. This is the Firestorm TAIS webinar series. This is the third in the 2016 series. Today we're discussing when others know more than you do. It's about visibility vulnerability. Our presenter today is the president of Firestorm, Jim Satterfield. We'd like to have you as our friend. You can become our friend at Firestorm Solutions on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter, Firestorm Soul. Yes, there is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We'd like to remind you, our presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. And this work product should be discussed in con with a conjunction with advice from your organization's personal counsel. In addition, do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. Firestorm is delighted to have an ongoing relationship with our good friends at the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools. You can watch previous webinars in this series by going to firestorm.com, and you can also register for future webinars. Our host today is Rich Martin. Uh, there we go. Rich is the executive director of the Tennessee Association of Independent Schools. Uh, Rich, over to you, please. Thanks, Bill. I want to thank you for continuing to provide these webinars. Very timely. This one is, uh, uh, as all of them, uh, full, maybe full of useful information. We did have a wonderful crisis uh, coach boot camp uh, last week with Jim Satterfield, who will be the presenter today. Uh, and a number of our schools were able to take advantage of that. And, uh, we look forward to working with uh, Firestorm uh, in the future as well. I do want to remind folks of some upcoming TAIS events uh, in April, the um, mini conference on admissions on the 12th of April at Chris, uh, Curry Ingram Academy, and on the 25th at Ensworth High School, we'll be doing a marvelous 2016 Tech uh, Institute, which was just been posted on the website and is now open for online registration. So we look forward to seeing many of you there. Uh, and now let's get on with... Um, uh, with this webinar, and I'll turn it back to Bill and Jim. Thanks, Rich. It's always a pleasure to be with you and the schools that we uh, have met face-to-face. -face. And uh, the session last week, we went through uh, some crisis exercises and gave uh, some opportunities to allow the schools to benchmark their plans relative to standards and best practices. And I think that's the, one of the themes that underlies with uh, our webinar series together and to continual learning. If there's topics that anyone would like to hear about, please share that with us and we'll work that into the editorial calendar and, and keep that information coming. Today we're going to focus uh, particularly on this subject of visibility vulnerability and I'd like you to think about when your school becomes a target. Uh, why? What caused that? Why is it a target? What do we need to be thinking about around that. Uh, what do we need to do? What do we need to say? Those are all going to be themes that we're going to uh, address in particular today. And I'd like you to start out by thinking about and asking your team in your school, what keeps you up at night? What, did, what are we most concerned about? Is it uh, bullying? Is it uh, inappropriate contact between teachers and students? Is it uh, cyberbullying? Is it sexting? Is it tornadoes that come across the state? Um, is it active shooter, as we have dealt with in the past? Think about whatever those vulnerabilities are, and as you start this process, I would encourage you to uh, think back about your vulnerability threat analysis for your school. Um, we talk about uh, regularly in, in, uh, an all-hazards approach, identifying what are all the things that could occur, what are their impacts on our facility, on our students, uh, on our financial resources. But equally with that, I'd like you to think about what are the warning signs that they're about to occur and um, what are the triggers that would suddenly activate our plans. And 
we're going to return to this theme a little bit in today's webinar. But as we start about this aspect of knowing what's going on, uh, let's think about someone knows, do you? Um, there's a lot of information that's out there today. Um, and in today's environment, the statistics are pretty staggering. 80% of the time, someone who has ill intent towards your school, someone else knows about it. 80% of the time. 67% of the time, two or more people know. And when they know, what do they do? They talk. And where do they talk? They talk on social media. So you have a responsibility. And there's an expectation. If I turn my child over to you uh, at the start of the day, I expect to get the child back at the end of the day. Your care, custody, and control comes into play. And I want my child back in roughly the same condition that I turn them over to you at the start of the day. So that information is out there, and it's getting blocked, as you can see in the example on the screen. And so what happens if you're the last to know? And generally, it's not a good thing. If everybody in your school knows that something's going on and you don't know, it's going to put you at a significant disadvantage. And it's hard to fix something that you don't know that's broken. It's hard to fix something that you're not aware of within your school. So you take this information, add your insight, and now you've got intelligence. And that becomes actionable for your plans and the actions that you're going to, to come into play. Now, if you don't know, that means that things come to you as a surprise. And generally, surprises aren't good. I uh, often say the last time a surprise was good, I was five, and it was my birthday. Uh, if you're at school and someone's coming running into your office with a surprise, it means that there's some type of a problem. And generally, it's a negative connotation. I think an exception to that is that there's a, a town, actually it's a small city in Arizona called Surprise, Arizona. There's 200,000 people there. So I guess waking up in surprise every morning if you're in Arizona is a good thing. Uh, they must like it or those 200,000 people wouldn't be living in Surprise, Arizona. But if you're waking up in a surprise in your school day after day after day, that's not a good thing. You're going to be at a significant disadvantage from that standpoint. So generally at work, at school, a surprise is not good, it's bad. And that's why having an understanding of what's going on becomes so very, very important around us. Now, many cases we find ourselves in disaster denial. Yeah, that, that exists, but it's not going to happen at my school. My students are different. Our, our values are such that it's not going to occur here. And, and I will challenge that a little as you think through all of the things that are uh, out in, in the area that can impact our schools every single day. Uh, so today we're in an environment where everything is foreseeable, and tomorrow anyone may be found accountable. Now, there's a concept here about if you're explaining, you're losing. And we're going to be talking about visibility, vulnerability uh, as we go further and further into this topic today. But this is a beginning standpoint. Now, I would point you back to a couple of events to put it in perspective. The 1993 bombing at the World Trade Center, that was the truck bomb that got into the garage. And they found the terrorists and found them guilty in a criminal trial. But there was a civil trial that most people did not focus on. In the civil trial, the jury awarded damages, and they awarded damages as follows. Two-thirds of the liability to the building owner, one-third of the liability to the terrorist who tried to blow it up. Uh, other than saying, great country, um, America, how could that be? Well, the answer is, the way that that could be is it was an identified vulnerability and threat, and there was an expectation that the, they were protecting the tenants and the public. There's an expectation that you're protecting your students, your teachers, and your school community. Now, over the last week, there's been a lot in the media about a trial that was going on. It was a civil suit, and it was brought by a, a reporter uh, on ESPN who'd stayed in a hotel, and uh, a stalker uh, got the room next to her and took pictures of her uh, and posted them on the internet. And, caught and found the person guilty in a criminal trial, but there was a civil trial regarding the damages associated with this, and she sued for $75 million, both the person who had done it and the hotel where she was staying. In the judgment, and it, got, uh, it was found 
that yes, there was damage to her. It was at 55 million, not the 75 million that was sued for. And I would assume on appeal that number will go down somewhat. But the jury awarded damages there, 51% to the uh, stalker that responsibility, but 49% to the hotel where it occurred. So I would tell you that you're going to be responsible. This is going to be an area where your school will be held accountable for the actions of others because there's an anticipation that you have thought about it, you've taken the proper measures, and you have things under control. So as we move forward in a crisis environment, and we think about not only crisis management but crisis communications, and you see some definitions here and understanding it, you've got to think both about your response and what you're going to say because in many cases how you respond, how you communicate, will create that second crisis. Now a crisis is generally short-lived. It's not going to be lasting for a great period of time, but the consequences are not. They're going to continue uh, to amount and build over time if you don't handle these events uh, correctly. Before we go a little deeper into specifically visibility vulnerability, I want to introduce a concept that you may not have thought about, and that's the, the concept of a bias that occurs from a media perspective. There's a, there's a media conflict bias that occurs. Um, the media loves conflict, and if there isn't some, they'll try to create it in that particular area. Now you see the figure in the middle holding the two uh, opponents kind of at bay there. The media loves to put themselves in the center of this conflict and see that it's continued to escalate. You don't have to look any further than the uh, elections that are going on where one candidate makes a comment about another, and uh, they then go to the to the second party and say, do you know they said this about you? And they get a response and they go back to the first and they say, they said this about what you said. And so this continues to move back and forth. So they are continually looking for conflict. That's why after an event occurs, they are, they're looking for somebody who goes, well, you know, they didn't tell us what to do or they weren't in control or no, the school didn't tell me what was happening. The media wants that conflict because the conflict keeps the issue alive, keeps the discussion going, and causes the visibility to escalate in that period of time. Now we're going to share with you in a few minutes a um, transparency commitment that we would like you to consider for your school because here is a way that you can reduce your exposure from that particular element here. So why does the media want conflict? That doesn't sound right. Well, because conflict is equal to ratings, ratings are equal to advertisers, and advertisers are equal to money. It's in the best interest of the media to continue to amplify the conflict so that starts to rise in that particular area and they can make more money out of the situation. So their objectives are different than yours. They want to see the conflict remain, they want to see the conflict escalate, and they're going to do everything they can in that process. Uh, to get those events in the biggest area. So if we move beyond that and we think about visibility vulnerability, now you see me, now you don't, the, on the left of your screen, not all visibility is bad. Some of it's good. Uh, I guess those people living in uh, uh, Surprise, Arizona are looking forward to that sunrise coming up every day and so that's good. The All the advertising and promotion that you're doing to promote your school and to point out the success of your students and graduates, uh, those are good visibility factors and we certainly encourage that type. And so you think about that type of visibility being a peacetime visibility because at this point um, your admissions director, your marketing, your advertising, your PR are all moving to build a visibility of all the wonderful things about your school. But if you find yourself at war, if you find yourself in a conflict, if you find yourself in a crisis, that type of a, um, visibility suddenly can make you the target. And you're at the center of the crosshairs there at that point in time. And so you're under a different level of visibility in a crisis in that type of an environment and the intensity of that visibility will continue to escalate. So if you're looking for a definition of visibility vulnerability, there are two parts of this. The first part 
is the fact that you're going to be seen. They're going to be, if there is a crisis, you're going to be at the center of it, and you'll get unwanted negative public and media attention as a result of that. So that's a visibility vulnerability created by the situation that you're in. Now, the second portion of the definition is it's not just about the visibility that you will have. It's about the visibility that you don't have in terms of understanding what's going on around you. If you come in as that surprise, remember the last time a surprise was good, I was five and it was my birthday, that's going to be an ineffective for you. You want to know what's going on. And if you haven't created this type of a intelligence network in your school, you're going to find you're at a significant disadvantage particularly in a crisis environment. So we're going to talk about both of these elements of this definition now for a few minutes. Now, on your screen, you should be seeing a series of dots. Some are white, some are light gray, some are darker gray, uh, and there's a varying level scattered out. Well, can you find your school on this screen? Well, no, Jim, all the dots look kind of the same. Nothing stands out. And that's exactly the point we want to make when we think about visibility vulnerability. If you're finding yourself in a crisis, then you're going to become much more aware to everyone around you. You should now be seeing a little red dot at the center of the screen. But it's easy to pick out the red dot. It's the only one that's shown on this screen. So at this point, you now are going to become under a microscope. The visibility of everything you say, everything you do will be disproportionately great. And so this is one of the things that we're focused on, of making sure you're aware of this so that you aren't that red dot that stands out. You're back into your white dot disappearing into the screen and no one is aware of you and no one is aware of associating you with whatever crisis or whatever event that's occurring. Firestorm has been responding to crisis events now for well over 10 years, and we've seen a lot of things happen, but quickly the media attention comes and focuses in on the school. If there are allegations of uh, sexual misconduct, if there's violence events that occurs, all of these elements are going to bring that attention to come in. And instead of being the invisible dot that we're looking at on the screen, once again our dot becomes clear and it's, we're seen and standing out. But it doesn't remain this size. It grows. And you should be seeing on your screen the dot coming in and taking on a much bigger profile in a perspective. That's what happens when we talk about visibility vulnerability. How you manage and how you respond and how you communicate in this crisis will make the difference of whether you're blending in, being seen, or standing out and having a disproportionate level of scrutiny come back on your school. Unfortunately, we've seen in these types of crisis events this becoming what defines what that school is. Not the years of success, not the great uh, job that they've done in building uh, family and community and values and having successful graduates go on to healthy, productive lives. It becomes this event defining the school. So that's the reason today why we're talking about visibility, vulnerability, and how those impact would come in. So let's shift back a little bit to that other side of seeing what's going on so that we know about this and it doesn't come as a surprise. So who knows? Well, the answer is other people know. Uh, your people, your students, your family, your teachers know a lot about what's going on. And the question is, are you listening for that? Are you looking for those areas there? The media is. If there was an arrest, they're going to uh, see that if there's been a report uh, going in to a particular area, now that it brings your school into focus and understanding of what those elements are. Social media, the comments that are being made, remember that statistic, 80% of the time somebody else knows, 67% of the time two or more knowing, and they start to talk. And so that knowledge is out there. And if you're not listening, if you're not looking, this problem escalates, becomes much broader, and then you become at the center of it like the red dot on the previous slide. So you have to do that to put all of these puzzle pieces back into play. If you don't understand what those are, you're going to find that managing this crisis is going to become significantly more difficult. So 
okay, wait a minute. How do I know what I don't know? Uh, that's a fair question. Now, you already know a lot of what you know. You know where you are located geographically. You are monitoring certain aspects of your school attendance uh, every day. And you may have some other programs in place. In fact, in some cases, you even know what you don't know. But you'll notice that that's the smaller portion of the pie that's appearing on the screen. What you don't know, you don't know, is the dominant portion of information out there. That means your ability to be surprised, your ability not able to respond becomes greater. Well, so how do we get that large orange portion down smaller? How do we get it over into the green square or even the blue so that at least we can have a better understanding? Take every one of the vulnerabilities and threats, every one of the hazards that you've identified in your uh, analysis, identify what potential uh, warning signs or indicators of that would be, and particularly what the subsequent triggers would need that we would spring into action. For example, um, communicable illness. Uh, absenteeism rates could be indications that there's something coming through the school, chicken pox, measles, flu. Uh, as we think about those types of areas, being aware if you are letting your students go on a a mission trip to uh, something somewhere in Latin America and the Zika virus is there, that it could come back and be a factor within your school. So creating those things makes a difference. Now we did a survey of hundreds of schools and we found um, several things out and it's not surprising. Less than a third, 30 percent, use some external intelligence to identify th potential threats. 37% didn't do anything and 30% didn't know, which means we don't have it. If you've got an intelligence network and you don't know about it, it's not doing you any good. So there's that 67% of the schools are at risk because they're not looking to find out if what they're concerned about is about to occur. By the way, that's one of the five common failures that we find in a disaster, the failure to identify and monitor all threats and risks. It's been one of the cornerstone characteristics that we find in each of these areas. So what do you do? How do you protect? Can you identify your organization's next crisis? And while a lot of the things listed on the screen behind that are more business oriented, but it could be uh, sexting, it could be sexual molestation, it could be improper contact, it could be cutting, it could be violence, it could be fraud. Uh, all of those elements are there within your school. It could be the board becoming involved. But one common theme that we have found is how schools respond to the crisis in front of them in many cases creates a second crisis and it's in fact as great or even greater than the crisis that's out there. So if you haven't taken the time to build an intelligence network, you're going to find yourself continually reacting instead of controlling the environment in which you find yourself. So let's talk just for a minute about making decisions in a crisis and what you need to be thinking about and doing. And then we're going to go back to this communications area where we started. So it's really not crisis management you should be thinking about. It's consequence management. What do we need to do to make this situation better, to manage and lower the impacts that we are seeing in our school, to keep the dominoes from falling, if you will, associated with it? The first thing I want you to understand is that you're going to be wrong. You're forced to make decisions between two bad choices. And so if here's a bad choice, there's a bad choice. You have to pick one of those two because of the areas that we're associated with. And you will then want to monitor and adjust your strategy, and we'll talk about that in just a second. My grandfather used to have a phrase, which would you rather have or whip it? Okay, granddad, I think I can figure this one out. I'll go for the non-whipping option. If you think in this particular area, though, in a crisis, both uh, or all the choices could be bad. But you have to make a decision and you have to act. You will be wrong. Be prepared. But be prepared then to adjust your strategies as you move forward. Now, there is a program called UDA that's Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act as a way to help you start to manage this crisis that's going on recognizing that a lot of the information that may be around you will be incorrect. Now, UDA came from the Air Force in the 1950s 
early 50s when we had the Korean War, there was a pilot, Colonel uh, Boyd, who was an ace. He shot down more of the North Korean MiGs than anyone else. And uh, in fact, it was more than an order of magnitude greater than any other pilot that America had. So the generals went to uh, Boyd, by the way, he was not a colonel at the time, and said, you know, how come you're doing better than everybody else? In fact, you're shooting down more than everybody else combined. And he says, well, I just do it faster. And they said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I, I observe that the MiGs don't have the ability to respond as quickly as we act. And their slow response creates an opportunity. So I, I make a move to, to dive or to veer to the right or veer to the left or to cut power. And before they can react, I, I orient where I am relative to them. I decide the best course of attack to take. And then I act quickly before they've had a chance to adjust. And that pr creates the strategic advantage for me in those areas. I will tell you the exact same thing will work for you if you're faced with a crisis within your school. You want to observe what's going on. What are people saying? What are they doing? You then have to uh, decide where is it relative to what's going on, what is going to be your action, and then you have to implement and continually get feedback and adjust that process. Those cycles will give you the type of control. You need to understand what's occurring. You have to decide. You have to act. You can't wait. You don't have the luxury of waiting and waiting and waiting for more information. In a crisis, you're going to have limited information, and you're going to be forced to act. But you again have to monitor what was right, what was wrong, what do I need to adjust, how do I need to move forward and, and to carry that process. Now, as you do this, we focus in Firestorm on a predict plan, perform methodology. You want to focus on what's known, not what you think, what you know. So predict what the consequences would be of whatever that information is. Develop your plan and then perform. Execute the plan that you've created. Now here's a hint. If you take notes as you're learning about this crisis uh, and it's occurring, just the mere fact you're writing down helps you to organize your process in terms of making these decisions. By the way, note the time that you learned of whatever it is, the source that you learned it from, and decide has this been verified or is this just one person's perception of what's going on. And then you want to create your action priorities. What are you going to do? And you're not doing it. You're going to assign others to do because you're going to continue to need to make these decisions to, uh, throughout the event. You have to have a follow-up time. Someone says they can find out how many students are here today or where we are, get that, get a report back, uh, and get confirmation that whatever you assigned them was in fact done. And then there will be some actions that you will identify that will be pending for later. You're not going to do them now. Uh, notifying the board, notifying the parents, because when we're right in the heart of the crisis, that's our biggest function. So what do you know? Are you concerned, if so, about what? What's your plan? What are you going to monitor? How are you going to monitor it? What do you, and who's got that responsibility? What are you going to communicate? And how are you going to do that? Now, in thinking about that and having all of these things identified in advance, it's easier to edit than it is to create. Putting together your crisis response and your crisis communications plan in advance will make it easier. Now, here's another significant step that I would encourage you to do. And that's a transparency communications commitment reach out to your parents and let them know that we're going to communicate directly with them and not through the media. Now preparedness, just like uh, communications, is a continuous improvement process. And if you tell your parents in advance that you're going to communicate directly with them and not through the media, that will significantly lower the pressure that you're going to find yourself in in a crisis. You, you're committing here to communicate only directly with parents, students, faculty, and staff and the board, and not through the media after a crisis event. You're going to communicate coordination and compliant information to any and all appropriate uh, stakeholders. You're going to commit to protect personal information about the students. We can't tell one parent the information about uh, someone else's child. We can only tell that parent or guardian of the child that's involved. We're going to communicate 
after the situation has been stabilized and the threats are controlled. If we're going into lockdown with our school, we're not going to be communicating until after that event is under control. We're not because we don't want to have situations where we're in a live event and we're uh, communicating out, and that might bring parents directly to the school at a time when that is not productive and would actually slow down first responder capabilities. We're going to communicate directly with the authorities anytime that their safety or health of a student is uh, to believe at risk. Is it domestic violence from the home? Is there other actions? We have a responsibility as professionals in this space to make sure that we communicate with uh, the Department of Family Services, with uh, the police, with others in those areas, and that we want to train our parents and our teachers and our students how we're going to communicate with them. Do we have an automatic notification system that will send out emails or phone calls or text messages? Are we going to be putting something on our website associated with that communication? So we're going to explain all these elements to our parents before the crisis occurs. We're not going to try to do this in the crisis. So as you think about back to school uh, at the end of the summer, this is the type of a communications that you would have with your parents to say, we're, we're going to take this transparency communications commitment from Firestorm and we're following it in our school. We're going to be giving this level of communications out. I'd recommend that this be placed on your website so that everyone understands this is who we are and this is how we'll operate. Now, we talked about the uh, warning signs and indicators. And I picked something a little different to try to stretch your mind today to think about what those indicators are. And this is around cyber breach. Now I know we're focused nearly about behaviors of concern and that's certainly very important, but this is another area to consider within your school. And I did this to say information assets, brand and reputation, and user experience. View this type of indicator, this type of an awareness, and then apply it to the other areas. What can you think about within your school? And remember that comment that others know. And so the problem here is that if computers are starting to be slow or people are saying, wait a minute, my information seems to have been compromised, that's an indicator that there was a cyber breach. If it works in those types of things, this works equally well when we're talking about the human element associated with your school. Then you take these indicators and you convert them over into an activation matrix so that everybody knows that if you see this, this is what you do and how you would act. We can create an activation matrix like this for a school around the things that you're concerned about in your particular school that will guide that decision process and I would encourage you to share that with your teachers, with your parents, and so that everyone knows this is how we're going to manage the exposure that we would have whether it's a natural disaster or a violence episode or, in this case, a cyber breach. Now, along with all of these areas, there are standards and best practices to be followed. We would encourage you to think about things in a five-stage environment, free action, onset, impact assessment, response and recovery, and post-disaster. So your plan should say, here's everything we're going to do before, the training, the identification, the writing of the plans, the writing of the communications, the recognition that it's happening, the onset where our focus is life and safety, the impact assessment, how bad is it, uh, and then the response and recovery. How do we respond to it? How do we get back into operation? And then reviewing and what we need to update regarding our plans. Where this is written in terms of cyber breach, the same thing is true in dealing with the other elements. The maturity models. Uh, and this one, again, is on cyber breach. There are maturity models around workplace violence, uh, around continuity, around all the emergency aspects associated with the school. But they have some similarities. In this one, you're seeing the first dimension is around risk management and oversight, the governance, uh, having those trainings and creating the culture within it, ha having a threat intelligence and collaboration area. What are you monitoring? How do you analyze that? How do you share the information? how you identify from a preventative, a detective basis to see that it's occurring, and to control the corrective. The external dependency of who you're connected with, what kind of resources do you would have involved, 
and even if you're talking about physical violence, the similar types of things would apply. And then finally, how you're going to manage the incident and how you are ever associated with it. There are standards and best practices for everything associated with crisis management and with the school safety and preparedness. I would encourage you to meet in a line and not be stuck back in that stage one where everything is the surprise, but start to move forward so it becomes strategic and part of your culture. Just like you want your school to be known for its academic excellence, the same thing should be considered here. So what do you do? What are our next steps? One, predict, establish an intelligence network. Uh, start to look at what you can do to monitor and be aware. Do the awareness prevention training with your teachers, with your students, with your parents so that they're in set. Have a security assessment done of your school. What are the vulnerabilities and threats that we need to be focused on here? Then develop a plan. And it's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a crisis response and a crisis communications plan with message map. Now this goes beyond just the uh, shelter in place and lockdown and lockout. How do we make decisions in this crisis? How do we respond? Uh, and how do we communicate? And it's much easier to edit than it is to create. If you put this in place in advance, then no one has to wonder what it is we're going to say and do. Then perform. You've got to train, 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 train. Everyone needs to know this is exactly what we're going to do. Now there is an opportunity coming up next month on April the 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern. There's going to be a virtual exercise so that you can put your safety team, your preparedness team, your emergency team, your crisis management team around a table and you will get to experience what it's like to address a sexting and cyberbullying uh, event that's occurring within your school. To think about that beforehand. Unfortunately, both of those items are prevalent today in America, and we respond to these on a very frequent basis. Uh, right now, we've got uh, two different schools that are involved in a sexting problem, and this isn't just a public school problem. This is a problem that independent and private and religious schools have equally as great. And so this is a two-hour exercise that you can sit there with your crisis team and go through making the decisions as we've laid out here and handling the communications because as you can imagine the potential for this to be a significant problem is quite great. So we did last month active shooter uh, and we had over 500 schools participate in a, in a violence active shooter scenario. I anticipate that this will be a comparable level. You'll have plenty of time during the exercise to sit and talk with your uh, team to decide what you would do at each point through the escalation. I would also encourage you to think about what the insurance coverages are that you have in place today. We have found, unfortunately, many of the crises that we respond to, um, there's insufficient insurance uh, to deal with the impact on the school, and you want to think about those issues. There are now coverages around sexual molestation, around cyber breach around um, deadly weapons that were not available before or even crisis management uh, coverages. I would encourage you to, to look at that and update it. We regularly do, uh, we don't sell insurance, but we have done analysis for schools. And I'd rather know about potential gaps before instead of after when we found there was a coverage. Make sure your plans align to standards and best practices. And then uh, as we think about these behaviors of concern, we're forming a user group nationally of those uh, schools that are active in dealing with behavioral risk and threat assessment and to uh, have a user group so that we can have a shared learning across all the schools. So there are a lot of steps that you can do to take and share in these areas. There will be a brief on today's exercise. You can go to the firestorm.com website and yeah, you would have it uh, sent directly to you. If you would like to view this webinar again or share it with others, I know we've got uh, spring break going on uh, in uh, Tennessee right now. We've got uh, a lot of people who are out of school at this point. Here's an opportunity that you can share with them to get that brief uh, and to learn what you can put in place to deal with this visibility vulnerability. So our thanks go out to the Tennessee Association of uh, 
independent schools and the value that is instilled there. I think that's a great example of how together, schools acting together, can make it for everyone involved. Rich, is there, are there any comments that you want to add into our discussion today? Um, not about what we've just been talking about. You did a great job of presenting that uh, information. But uh, I did want to push a, uh, forward a couple of other events later in the, the semester from TAIS, and that includes in Memphis on the evening of the 27th, that's a Wednesday, there'll be a, uh, a workshop for heads of school and trustees, and it will be Kirk Walker, who's the president of SAIS. It's going to be excellent. And then we have two events that have been just added to our calendar in the last week uh, on April 29th. Uh, a presentation on the consultative business officer by Scott Barron of School Growth, and on May 3rd, a presentation by Mark Christensen of Blackboard on your online presence, meaning your schools, and interestingly, managing social media, which is the tricky thing to, to, to manage these days. So these are great opportunities for you to uh, learn something useful for your school, and we want you to take advantage of them. So. As with, with Firestorm's webinars and, and workshops, these are all here for you to help your school meet its commitments to its employees and its families, its students, always better and better. Thanks a lot, and back to you, Jim. Well, we appreciate it, and these are great opportunities, and I think the association does a, a, a wonderful job of supporting the schools and the members. If you would like to view this webinar again or go back and view any of the past webinars, and this is an online resource library for your school, and it's included in your membership with the AIS, go to firestorm.com. If you've got a question, you can drop us an email at webinars at firestorm.com, or you can pick up the phone and call us at 800-321-2219. Uh, we will try to reach out to everyone on today's webinars to see if you've got questions and to see how we can provide that assistance. Recognize that a crisis is a different environment from which you operate in, a different set of rules on how to manage the consequences that come from that. You're going to find that you're going to be in a position of visibility, vulnerability. You're going to find that the, everything is going to take on a larger impact and a greater proportion than it did before these events occurred. So, each one of these areas becomes absolutely critical. Managing that knowledge, making sure that you know what's going on around you, your visibility out, making sure that when you're communicating, you're communicating directly with your uh, appropriate stakeholders and never communicate through the media. Thanks, everyone. I wish you a great spring and enjoy the wonderful weather. And until next month, we'll be talking with you again. Good day. Goodbye.